Okay, I think the fade out means it's time for me to talk. Hello, everyone. Hello. Uh, I'm Giles Wittell, an editor at Tortoise. Welcome to our regular Friday lunchtime Sensemaker Live Thinking, supported by Santander. Thank you very much, Santander. And thank you, uh, whoever chose the lead in music. I think that was Phoebe. You deserve a beer or a tequila when this pandemic is all over, because that's a vast improvement on the previous one. Um, our subject today is America and COVID, and really it could, ha it could hardly be more timely. I'm hoping that we'll talk about um, COVID's impact on America, but also America's potential impact on COVID. Uh, but we have to start with the first of those, I think, because I mean, the reason that we programmed this is one of three uh, US-based thinkings on consecutive Fridays in the run-up to the election, is that it will probably be the issue that decides the election, or at least from my remote perspective this morning, writing a Daily Sensemaker newsletter, I um, expressed the view that the election continues to be a referendum on Trump's response to, to COVID. Um, because of the perception that it's been a catastrophically botched response. So there are many questions that I'm hoping that we can get to. Has it really been uh, a botched response? It turns out that European governments can mess up horrifically as well, including our own here in the UK. Um, but maybe it's only the perception that matters. Uh, maybe the, um, the framing question that I chose, what happened to can do, is actually very unfair. And I would say, particularly this week, it feels unfair because um, you guys, if I can call you you guys uh, dialing in from the East Coast, uh, just in case you hadn't noticed, put a probe on an asteroid this week. And I salute you. I think that was completely extraordinary. But I digress. Uh, COVID has killed uh, more than 220,000 Americans, 228,423 as of today. Um, of course, Trump's line is that it could have been 2 million or more, but for the actions that he's taken. Uh, his defenders point out that in terms of infections and deaths per capita, the US numbers are no worse than those, and in some cases are better than those of comparable advanced economies, including, uh, including our own. Um, but his critics say America should expect more of itself. Um, so I hope that we can get to questions like, what could the federal government have done differently? What difference would it have made? Who is really at fault in this big complicated uh, federal system? Um, and what could America have done for the rest of the world these past nine months? And to the extent that the way it has responded to the pandemic, uh, what can be done in the, in the near future to repair the damage done to the American brand? Um, we've got some great uh, invited speakers. We've even got a little slideshow for you, which we'll get to in, in a second. Uh, but first, just for those of you, and there may be some who've never been to a thinking before, um, it is your points of view also that we want to harvest for our journalism here at Tortoise, and we do that by inviting you to raise your digital hands. You know how to do that probably. The participants tab at the bottom of your screen brings up a list of everybody who's here, a raise hand button. Uh, we'll do a practice run on that in a second. Um, my colleague, I lose track. Who's running the chat today? It's Ella or Zav? My colleague, Zav is running the chat and he's also gonna be doing the um, uh, the, the slides in a little bit. Um, so please, as he said, if you have anything you want to say that you might not want to verbalize, put it in the chat. Uh, and we may ask you to verbalize it if it's interesting. It always is, but we might, it may come to you there as well. Um, so I promised a quick uh, practice run with, the, with the raise your hands. If you can click on the participants button and uh, raise your hand if you agree that, uh, Caroline's been very quick off the mark there, if you agree that Trump is essentially responsible for the 
uh, outsized death toll from COVID in the US. The context, I should say, is that he did, for the first time, say, I accept full responsibility. I think we can um, assume what he meant by that was for the federal response last night in, in the debate. OK, uh, raise your hands. Thanks very much. Uh, uh, lower, lower your hands, those of you who've raised them, uh, and raise them if you, if you think the reverse, that uh, on this particular uh, issue, the buck didn't stop with him, that it was that the death toll has not been his responsibility. We have one hand. Lillian, interesting. Um, I think a perfectly defensible arg argument. Maybe we'll come to you in a little bit. But um, because time always flies, let's. I just want to go first to Dr. Nicolette Lewis Saint, who is executive director of an organization called Health Ready in the US. Uh, and she's joined us from from Baltimore, is it? I am based in Baltimore, but we're we're headquartered in DC. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much for being with us. Health ready. Um, I mean, healthcare could hardly ready. be more. I'm sorry. <laughs> healthcare ready. Healthcare ready. It's my own <laughs> abbreviation. I apologize. Um, exists to strengthen America's preparedness or the preparedness of uh, healthcare supply chains for things like natural disasters, including specifically pandemics. So can you explain for what is largely a European um, audience what you think uh, the federal response in this case should have been? And by all means, if you want to um, set out briefly the difference between federal and state responsibilities. Sure. So one of the reasons we exist is because the complexity of a federal government system means that you, when, when you're thinking about a supply chain, you have multinational businesses that are part of a global supply chain working to provide medicines, not just to the US, but also to other countries, as well as a federal government system that has on one side of it, a, a robust and, and, and complex public health system and then the other side of it, an emergency management system that don't always quite speak to each other. And at the top of that, you do have federal government leadership. So our goal is first and foremost, making sure that the coordination that needs to happen across the supply chain can happen so that we are discussing um, plans and building preparedness plans with manufacturers, distributors, what we call dispensers, providers of all types that could be at the point of dispensing for a patient, um, as well as with federal government partners on either side of that public health emergency management. Um, and the reason that is so critical when you're thinking about preparedness is because one of the historical challenges we've had in the United States is how we prioritize preparedness. Is it something that we are going to routinely invest in or is it something that we're only going to invest in at the point of response? Many of the pieces of infrastructure that actually helped buoy us for the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic were a result of supplemental funding that came from the Ebola response actually. And so when you look at how we invest in preparedness, it leaves some major gaps um, and it leaves opportunities for, for it to not be clear what is going to be within the purview of the federal authority versus the state or the local. And in the United States, when dealing with disasters, especially the local government is always in charge. That's a big premise of how we manage emergencies in the US. And so. The federal government, of course, has the authority, but when it comes to things like stay at home orders or it would come to um, deciding what assistance to accept, the local mayor, the governors, um, that, that's where those decisions are made. And so that's part of our complexity in the US is working through the maze of who gets to decide what. And when it came to the stay at home orders um, or the discussion about a mask mandate, um, that's when you began to see some of that um, really erupt. Um, but it's come down to everything from how schools have reopened, how sports programs for youth have, have reengaged. Those are all local decisions. And it's important to talk about the medicines, but it's also important to talk about what's going to increase the potential exposure and then the demand on those medicines. And some of those behaviors that are decided at the local level are a part of that. 
Nicolette, can a president force the hand of a governor or a mayor? Uh, we understand that federal law in matters of law trumps state, but was it within Trump's gift to issue executive orders that forced, for example, the wearing of masks? I mean, the, the context, let's not beat around yeah. the bush here, I, um, is, is, is a very, very politicized and, and strongly worded debate in which, for example, a former head of the CDC uh, wrote to the uh, serving uh, head of the CDC, Robert Redfield, mm -hmm. this is a slaughter and not just a political dispute. Sure. So yes, is my understanding because there are a few, um, what we call blue sky, normal day, nothing's happening. That's a different question, what would be allowed? But because the, um, the in invoking of the National Emergencies Act, as well as the declaration of a disaster were, were in place and, and remain in place, the president does have the authority to, whether it's by, um, by partnership with governors, which is where you would ideally start sitting around the table and saying, this is what we're going to collectively do versus forcing a mandate, the president does have that authority. So whether it is um, a mask mandate or some sort of movement restriction that could be in place, that is something that the federal government could determine. And of course, it's not just about specific instructions, is it? It's about the tone uh, and the approach. I want to move on to Julia in a second. But while we're with you, Nicolette, um, rewind and tell us how you feel, what you feel the ideal federal response, I know it's a huge question, would have been and when would it have started and, and who would he have gathered around the table in the Roosevelt room? Okay, so let's go back to, I would say January. Um, March is too late, but January, I, I think you're you're having you're having a, a PSC meeting. The, so the president is pulling together his cabinet, um, having discussions about the different parts of the federal government that need to be engaged. It didn't have to come to the U.S. shores for that mobilization of the federal government to begin. Um, and what I what I expect Gail to touch on is is very much how how that happened in in responses past. Um, and so I what I would what I would frame out is the understanding that any disaster response, any disease outbreak response is going to require the entire federal government before it comes to our shores. And so really working through with the HHS secretary and even the secretary of defense, because HHS the DOD, is Department of Health and Human, Human Services. So our health minister working through with our health minister, working through with our defense secretary, um, what the roles of those agencies and departments would be, um, how we're going to first and foremost work within the UN system, work with our multilateral partners, um, what we need to understand as it pertains to the likelihood that it's going to move to the US, and then also having a plan for working with businesses. If we recall, cruise ships were a big problem for us early in the year. Um, that's an opportunity to start working with the travel industry, the tourism industry, to determine with your, uh, ideally your commerce secretary, what can be done, uh, what protections are in place, and then being able to activate your public health ministry, your art for us, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, to make sure that they have the resources that they need to conduct the science and the examination across the CDC, as well as within our National Institutes of Health to determine what protections, what guidances are in place. But that activation happens really at the top of the year. When we saw that there were reports in China that's when that level of engagement can happen. And that also informs how you begin to work with the states, specifically the governors. Right. Thank you so much. And of course, at the top of the year is when Trump was in Davos saying he had it all in hand and none of those conversations were happening. Thank you. Um, Julia Belouz, uh, you are a senior health correspondent at Vox and you're dialing in from Vienna, uh, as I understand it. Yes. Well, last night, I couldn't help noticing that in the Rapid Vienna Stadium, where Arsenal won 2-1, um, there were quite a few people. They're beginning to let people back into the stadium. So clearly something is going right in the local response to COVID. 
there. But I again, I, I digress. From where, from where you're sitting, um, first of all, is the narrative that Trump has got this catastrophically wrong in the state, is that fair? And if so, from where you're sitting, is it obvious what he got wrong? But it's a it's a great question, and it's I think a complicated one to unpack. So, um, so I've been spending a lot of time. I, I was covering the the pandemic from January, and then had a baby in March. The baby is blissfully unaware of what a dumpster fire um, the world is right now, and came back um, came back to the beat in September. And so when I left um, when I left off covering everything, we were kind of at this point where we thought you know, the US has, is coming from such a strong point, right? You know, the CDC, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, basically wrote the um, rule book on how you respond to pandemics and epidemics, how you do these basic um, public health things that need to happen in a disease response. Um, obviously an incredibly um, wealthy country. And, and then coming back, coming back to the story in September, what's become so clear is that there's almost like, there's very little correlation between um, the resources that a country has had and how well they're performing um, in this pandemic. There's little correlation, um, even yeah, Nicolette raised the, the issue of um, the federalized response in the US that, that so much does happen at the state and community level when it comes to public health. There has been this like gutting of funding for, for these um, public health entities that, that predates Trump. Um, so that's been happening for years before Trump came into power. Um, but then we see other countries like Germany that also has a federalized um, something like 400, um, obviously there's 16 states in Germany and something like 400 um, uh, uh, public health um, entities at the sub um, state level. So, and, and but, but you, you, you had this, so not very strong leadership also at the federal level and not this like absolute denialism of the science um, and of what, of, of expert advice um, in a country like Germany. So yeah, I don't know if that, that, that's kind of a meandering answer, but so those are some of the things I guess that are on my mind coming back to the story that we, we start in the US, the US started at such a strong point um, with resources and with expertise and completely failed to capitalize on that. And um, at the same time, we can't, I think, only blame Trump for, for where we're at now. Right. But the, the comparison that you make with Germany is interesting, isn't it? Because that's another federal system, albeit um, not, not as big, but, but almost as, as complicated. Um, do you recall specific moments when Merkel got all the stakeholders around the table in Berlin and uh, 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 agreed a coordinated response, or have or has Germany's uh, much better, uh, more effective response in terms of cases and deaths per capita been largely a result of sort of infrastructure being already in place and just ready to go? I think yeah, the. the the story that in the international press, a lot of the credit goes to Merkel, I guess, for right. her strong leadership. And obviously she has had, I think, incredibly strong leadership at the, the national level. But um, obviously, yeah, the response is being carried out at the state level. And there are examples of places in Germany that have done a better job than others. But I, I was actually just re reporting on this um, in the last few weeks and talking to people in Germany. And one thing I heard again and again is, at the local level, um, you had leaders who were really listening to scientists and really talking to scientists um, on a regular basis from the beginning. So from, um, as Nicolette points out, from that moment where you want that engagement to start happening from January. Um, and, and, and then in when, so Germany was one of the first countries, if you recall, to have um, COVID cases identified in Europe. And um, in, in March, they had this outbreak that happened at an auto parts um, manufacturer in, Mun in the Munich area. And they, um, at that point, um, there, were, there were, yeah, already, there was already testing. Uh, so a diagnostic test available, thanks to some of the efforts by scientists in um, Berlin and in Munich. And you already had um, discussions on how to rapidly expand testing 
right. um, and scale it up throughout the country, mo modeling, um, modeled on what was happening in Asia. So learning from Asia and applying it um, in Europe. And that that's like, yeah, another place where just to contrast it to the US, there was this like catastrophic bungling of even a diagnostic early on in the pandemic. Um, and yeah, again, all the resources and expertise available to not bungle that so catastrophically. Great. Now, in a second, we're going to come to uh, Gail Smith, presidency over one campaign. But since we have you, Julia, and uh, you have to go soon, I, I noticed that you've written recently about the US decision not to take part in the COVAX vaccine scheme, which is a scheme to ensure that all countries have affordable uh, vaccines, regardless of GDP. Do, do you think, I mean, there's a knee jerk response to that decision by this administration, but let's, let's try and park the context. Is that from the perspective of an American uh, political CEO, is that a smart decision or an own goal? I think, yeah, uh, well, what this pandemic has revealed is that we're only as healthy as like, you know, in the US as any other, if we, if we have these outbreaks anywhere, they can very quickly become a problem for the world. And um, if anything, I think this pandemic has highlighted the need for global collective action on problems like, yeah, global health, like climate change. And so th th that is, should be top of agenda now. It's so incredibly important. And yet um, this is an example where the US is going the other way. And um, yeah, it's not, I think, something that can easily be undone with a change in leadership either when you have um, large swaths of the population that don't believe in um, or don't want to be part of these global collective agreements and um, bodies like the United Nations or, or others. So. Um, yeah, I, I think maybe he's pandering to his base in, in that decision, but obviously I don't think it's a wise decision at a moment where so many of our biggest problems are com com complex and require um, global coordination. Great. Thank you. Thank you, not least, for the very elegant segue that that gives me to come to Gail. Uh, Gail, thanks for joining us. We've spoken before on the, on the sort of parallel uh, decision by the current administration uh, to withdraw from the WHO and to attempt to defund the WHO. But speaking more broadly, um, from, with your global perspective, how much damage has the US response to COVID so far done to the US brand? And I, I return to, uh, the, the, the question, what happened to can do? This has been a, yeah. a, a, a test, a, a very severe test, but test nonetheless of, of competence in which the world's richest country has been found wanting. How long will it take to recover? Well, I, I think it'll take us some time, but the, the reason for the colossal failure, and you, you started out by saying the perception of a colossal failure, I think it's a fact, are the same reasons <clears throat> and the same ways of proceeding that can allow us to rebuild. Let me explain what I mean. Uh, we are looking now at a surge in over 20 states and the worst mismanagement of a national global crisis that I've certainly seen in my lifetime. Why? Nicolette's right that preparedness is important. Uh, we left this administration prepared. In the eight years of the Obama administration, seven viruses commanded the attention of the White House, including up to the president. We therefore built on that knowledge, left behind a directorate in the National Security Council, a playbook for how to respond, and ran what's called a tabletop exercise for the entire new cabinet. So they were prepared, they dismantled them. The second, and this, this pertains both to the national response, but how the US has responded to this globally. Um, this White House never laid down a federal strategy. It sort of said, it's up to the states. Each of you do what you want. Here's some general guidance. If you think about it, that makes no sense for a virus that moves across borders, whether they be state borders or national borders. And it's the same problem we have globally. We don't have a global response. We have a fragmented response. That gives space to the virus to move faster than we are. I think the, the third point that is 
been really problematic and I think hurt us enormously globally. You know, we all know we're living at a time uh, when there's a lot of misinformation and disinformation out there. Um, <clears throat> we're also living at a time, and I never imagined this in my lifetime, where science in some circles has become a matter of opinion rather than fact. But when that's promulgated by the leadership of the United States, whether it be with respect to questioning its own CDC or the WHO or having guidance on masks and then discounting it at the highest levels of the White House, um, that has cluttered the space because science is the fact-based, should be unemotional, apolitical tool that we have to deal with something like a virus. Finally, both nationally and globally, this pandemic has been politicized to extremes that have proven dangerous in terms of the number of deaths, but costly from a health and economic perspective because it has extended the lifespan of the pandemic. We've heard a president who has talked about red states and blue states, democratic states and Republican states in managing a virus that spreads across borders. This is quite unprecedented. We've got a leadership that is, as you rightly point out, withdrawn from the WHO, condemned it, trashed it at every convenient opportunity, but also gone so far as to politicize the data coming from the Centers for Disease Control, the CDC, which has historically been sort of the gold standard for national uh, health institutes like that. So I think we've got a real problem here um, the problem we have internationally is injecting politicization, uh, mismanaging and misrepresenting science. And as you rightly point out, not joining things like COVAX when China has joined COVAX. Right. I think the question is going to be, and we do have this election forthcoming, um, and I think it's going to determine in many ways whether the United States uh, seeks very immediately the global cooperation that could help us collectively shorten the lifespan of the pandemic or we continue down the road we're on. So it's a really key determinant, I think, of where we will go both nationally and internationally. Yeah, I, I bet. Um, by the way, I'd be really interested to know your, your take on whether last night's debate, which was civilized compared with the previous one, yeah. Um, might move the dial at all. But just, uh, I want to pick up on, on a point that you made. It's a, it's a general point, but it, it got me thinking. Uh, the fact that there's no coordinated federal response, you said, and the, and the fact that science is now regarded uh, as a matter of opinion, not fact, has given the virus space and, and cluttered that space. I wonder, I feel myself that uh, over here, at any rate, we've we've become fatalistic about this virus, and and it doesn't occur to me anymore to imagine a scenario in which, for example, uh, there had been a strategy that prevented a second wave. I only just thought about that now. I mean, can you can you suggest specific steps that the U.S. federal government might have taken with Europe and the WHO? That, that might actually have um, contained that space, restricted yeah. the space in which, uh, and prevented a second wave. I mean, could, could I mean, hindsight is, is all very well, but is, is that is possible that that might Well, it, whether it could, would have prevented a second wave or reduced the first wave sufficiently to mean if there was another bump, it would have been smaller. I think there are a number of things. First is the coordination of measures so on international travel, for example, every country just made its decision. There was no coordination of that. Yeah. You go back to Ebola, we had a very coordinated strategy between and among countries. It, it isn't going to stop importation, but you can reduce it far more effectively if you're coordinated. The second is there was never a global supply chain. And every country, I mean, we had battles on the high seas for masks when what should have happened is countries should have come together. It would have been possible to do a baseline inventory of where these supplies are, figure out how to deploy them so that the response could have been sequenced to match where the virus was spiking, right? I mean, one of the things I learned during the Ebola epidemic, I always thought of if the virus is moving faster than we are, we're losing. Mm -hmm. So how do you move faster than the virus? 
You've got to surround it where you have outbreaks. You've got to prioritize where you deploy all of the tools. The third is on the testing side. Um, it was very uneven. And yes, we were flying the plane as we were building it in terms of developing testing capabilities. But again, these were deployed in a really ad hoc fashion with no consistent methodology. All those things give advantage to the virus and its ability to spread. The last thing I would say, and we've seen some leaders do a very good job of this, obviously New Zealand, I think Chancellor Merkel has been terrific in explaining the science. We needed world leaders with a single voice to be explaining to the world's people how this works, to putting the scientists out there to explain it and to leaving the politics in their offices. And that didn't happen. And that would have made a huge difference because it would have narrowed the space for what is tragically and dangerously a political debate about mm. the nature of a virus. Mm. So I think there are a number of things that could have been done. The last thing I would mention is that on the WHO, um, the WHO, we are all members. It's as good as we make it. Withdrawing was catastrophic in my view. But that should have been a node where everybody joined forces to make sure the world had the right information, the same information, we were coordinated and tight. Because the fact of the matter is, we should be and can be smarter than this virus. Right now, it's still running circles around us. Yeah. Uh, and as you say, it's been politicized. So I can't resist. In the extreme. Last, uh, last night, Trump said again, it will go away. We need to learn to live with this. Biden said, wait a minute, we're dying from it. Uh, did it move the dial? You know, I doubt that that debate moved the dial much on anything because I, I think there are likely very few people who still remain undecided. So I think it's more likely that it solidified people's views. I do think you're right that the virus itself and the health impacts as well as the economic impacts is likely to be the prominent issue that will drive voters. But we've already had over 45 million people vote early. So I, I don't think it moved, likely it didn't move mm -hmm. the dial. Uh, but as all these debates are, it's always interesting to see what comes out. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Um, in, in a minute, uh, I'd like to see if we can uh, harvest some views from, from the chat. I notice people have been speculating on, on what a Biden win might mean. I'd be really interested to know what you guys, including, for example, Effie, uh, I don't have your surname, uh, think about that. But first, let's go to my colleague, Xavier Greenwood, and his slides. Hello, can you hear me? I can. Okay, good. I hope everyone else can. Um, so this is the kind of lowdown on death rates. Um, so the US, and I think this was kind of partly covered in Giles's preamble. So the US is not the worst country in the world in terms of its death rates, um, but obviously we should bear in mind it has immense resources, it has scientific expertise. Um, as Julia said earlier, there's been uh, not much correlation between the level of resources countries have and their, the strength of their response. Uh, you can really see that indicated with the US. Um, so, I mean, it, it's, it's ninth in the kind of top 10 deaths per million people of, of kind of larger countries. Um, but maybe a more striking fact is that it has 4% of the world's population, but 20% of the world's deaths. So um, you probably should be seeing that as a failure. And as Gail said, is now seeing a surge in 20 states and a third wave. Um, then if we go to the next slide, um, this all reflects on what Americans think of their response. So at this point in time, about 58% of Americans disapprove of Trump's handling of COVID. Um, and there's a huge partisan split here. So 82% of Republicans are happy with Trump's response, um, but just 6.5% of Democrats. And when it comes to independents who are demographic, who Trump would like to win votes from, just 35% approve of his handling, handling of COVID. So maybe go, go some way to explaining why he seems to be languishing in the polls at the moment. Um, and if we go to the third slide, uh, this will probably bring some problems for him in the upcoming election. Uh, so his handling of the coronavirus has been cited as the main reason that seniors seem to be abandoning him in some states. And as you can see here, COVID is clearly the biggest concern for all voters, followed by the economy 
Um, and just for context, in 2016, the top two voting issues for Americans were the economy and terrorism. And terrorism doesn't even make it to this year's list of top issues. COVID is, is kind of dominating. Um, then if we go to the fourth side, uh, what has undermined Trump's response to COVID? Well, in the first instance, as Gail mentioned, uh, he disbanded a National Security Council directorate in 2018, and that was set up to prepare for the next pandemic. And throughout the crisis itself, he's obviously made quite visible missteps, not least hosting his own super spreader event at the White House and undermining his own health team, uh, specifically Fauci in the last couple of weeks. Um, and then the final slide is a kind of one vision of a way forward. And I think there is reason to be positive. If either Trump, you know, learns to handle the response better, or if, if there's a Biden presidency, which does things differently. So Obama's former healthcare, healthcare head has pointed out that the good news is we're always four weeks away from defeating the virus. The bad news is that we've always been four weeks away. Um, Biden in both debates has held up a mask and talk, talked about the number of people who would be saved if everyone just wore a mask. Um, and as you can see here from this projection, um, you know, by these projections, it would be tens, hundreds of thousands of lives that would be saved in two scenarios where you e either have universal mask wearing, which is 95% of people wearing a mask, or you continue to ease mandates. So the virus is obviously not over in the US and it can still be handled better in the future, depending on what policies are put in place. Um, and that's everything. Uh, thanks very much, Zav. Yeah, I, I mentioned uh, Effie. If uh, you're worried about the people who've been allowed to believe that it's a conspiracy or not to do with them and raise the question of whether a Biden presidency could overcome <clears throat> that sort of information deficit, can we come to you and, and explain that so that you could explain in a little more detail what your concern is? I suppose my concern is it's like, you have the issue with the science, the pushback that's going to be needed to solve or at least improve the situation on the ground with people getting better, people getting vaccines, testing, all of that. And then the separate bit is where you have to convince a set of people who have kind of been led to believe it's a political thing, that it's a belief system that they, their rights are being infringed on. And how is there like a strategy that you could have to make them kind of come round to this idea that actually it does affect them it is a united thing it's not red versus blue and i wonder mm -hmm. if maybe they should be separate things to think about instead of it all just being the science will fix it because you also need those people on board in a way absolutely it's a, it's a really good point i apologize if you can hear my dog in the background i wonder if we could come back to uh, nicolette on this because clearly there are the uh federal public health agencies whose job it is to uh, do conventional public health work, as it were. But there's a very large number of people who are about to go out and vote um, who, as Effie says, um, feel somehow immune from, from this pandemic. Uh, is there a big um, public education job as well that needs to be done that's not being done? And and how might how might that get done after November 3rd? Absolutely. So I would I would begin by saying our science communication has always needed more work. Um, how how we have gone about educating around science and 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 making sure that we are not just saying here is the directive, but explaining what goes into that directive has been an ongoing challenge for the field of public health. Um, but I think what you do is you use trusted messengers. That is that has been a tool across global health, across U.S. domestic public health. That has been a big piece of this. We are more polarized right now than we have ever been, and and part of that challenge is that it's not <coughs> going to be enough to have a single person stand and say this is what we need to do and here's why. It doesn't matter if they're right or wrong, it's going to be probably absorbed by close to 50% and rejected by another 50%. But that's why you have to build coalitions. And so I, I think a part of that is going to be, in my mind, not everyone's always gonna be on board. 
but there's an opportunity to bring more people on board by thinking about where they are getting their information, who do they trust and how, how do they get information, get the, get the, same, the same mandates, ask their questions, convey their skepticism in ways that can be addressed from someone that they trust. I think this is something we've done in the US and have, have been working to do around this pandemic in communities of color, for example, recognizing that there are certain skepticisms, there's a certain level of medical mistrust that has a long arc before COVID and we've had to get their trusted messengers engaged and we've had to make sure that the people who are going to be deployers of that information have the resources that they need. I think that's a part of it. But I also think part of this is making sure that as we are creating policy, you know, to Gail's point about the fragmentation, part of this is the federal government can't be saying one thing and the state saying another thing and a local government saying something else. So making sure that even when we're talking about how we're harmonizing on policy and messages, we need to have one message. Right. Can you just give a little bit more of a sense of what you mean by trusted messengers? I'm sure this is something sure that I should understand, but are we talking Dwayne Johnson here? I think we're, we're probably not talking The Rock, um, but we are talking a pastor. We are talking a community leader. Um, you know, I, I would say I am not, you know, as a huge wrestling fan, I'm not taking my public health information from The Rock, but I do understand that some people might see it being credible if he's saying, hey, listen to the CDC. Um, but but when I say trusted messengers, I'm really talking about those um, individuals who have a, a role in a community, in parts of society that are traditionally not, they're not going to be the government leaders necessarily. They're not going to be parts of a federal bureaucracy, but they have a role in a community that gives them a position of power and a position of trust. And so they do have the ability to speak, whether it's the rabbi speaking about what they what needs to happen within um, their, their synagogue, or it's the pastor speaking about the importance of a vaccine or, to, or wearing a mask or a school teacher or educator. Um, I think those are the voices that have not been fully mobilized. And that's really what, when I'm thinking about trusted messengers, it's, it's that we do, when we're, if we're gonna be honest about it, we're so fragmented that we do have to be honest about how to actually penetrate those, those different sects that have formed. And a part of that is understanding who they're listening to and where they're getting information. Great, thank you. Uh, as, I, as I think you know, I wasn't being facetious about The Rock, by the way. I was, was incredibly yeah. powerful on Black Lives Matter, and I was listening to one of his Instagram posts last night, potential future president, but we're getting ahead of ourselves. Um, uh, uh, Gail, maybe you'd like to jump in here, not least because Louise in the chat has, uh, uh, is already asking you to join a Biden uh, administration. Perhaps you can tell us if you would, but, but, but also on this communications uh, challenge, um, is it possible that Biden is sufficiently of the center uh, to succeed there? Let's just suppose for, this, for, for the time being, yeah. for sake of argument, that he's the next president, to succeed there in a, in a way that um, the left of the Democratic Party wouldn't if it had been a candidate from there? Well, I, I think a couple of things, and I, I think underscoring what Nicolette just said about communications and trusted messengers is absolutely key. And part of the question is whether a president, if it were a Biden presidency, can the president of the United States be a trusted messenger in the kind of polarized political environment we're living in now? Um, certainly from an optimistic perspective, I would say yes, I think it's going to take time. But this moment has caused me to think often about the days and weeks in the United States in the immediate aftermath of September 11th. And while there were acts and statements that were reprehensible and discriminatory and so on and so forth, George Bush, about whom there was a lot of debate, and there was tremendous, we thought it was tremendous division then, we had no idea what we were in for. Uh, but when he spoke to the nation, he truly spoke to the nation. He didn't speak as a Republican. He didn't speak as a member of a political party. He spoke as a president. And I do think that Vice President Biden has a long history of being one who's worked across the aisle. His, his tenure in the Senate uh, was one characterized by a great deal of bipartisanship. 
Uh, I think one of the key lines that he used last night, which I think will resonate with many, it will not resonate with some, but was that if I'm elected, I intend to be the president of the entire United States. I'm a Democrat, but I will not only serve, I will not you know, restrict my service just to one party. And I think there's a certain longing for that. So I think one question is, can he do that? I do think he is a candidate that uh, is more moderate than some of the other candidates. But one of the things that's been interesting is to see the, the real unity in the Democratic Party of all of those former candidates coming together and trying to forge a common way forward. <clears throat> so I'm, you know, look, I, I can't be cynical because if I was cynical, I would be utterly despondent and incapable of doing anything. So I remain optimistic, but I think it's gonna be a, a challenge to marry genuine national leadership from the top to the kind of grassroots trusted interlocutors that Nicolette refers to across the country. That's what we're gonna need. And it's gonna be hard. I happen to believe there are a majority of people in the United States who wanna see that happen. So maybe we can get a groundswell and put ourselves on a different path. Mm. It's, it almost feels as if as, as long as the emergency is um, uh, front and center and life and death, that there is a possibility of that. I, but I'm looking at what- but Can I add one quick thing? Yeah, of course. Because you, know, you said this thing at the beginning about can do. And that's a real American thing. Like we can do anything. Oh, by the way, it's also a, a real thing about the way the rest of the world looks at your country. Yes. Yeah. And I think part of the question is whether leadership both locally and nationally has the ability to tap into that fundamental sense of American pride that we can do anything. Mm and can kind of seek to enlist the American people in saying, not only can we conquer this at home, we can you know, get into the leadership of conquering this globally with our partners. So there's, there are avenues to go down. Uh, it's just a question of who's driving the car and which way they turn. Yeah, it's completely fascinating. Uh, the, the, the idea of harnessing American pride and taking it in the opposite direction to yeah. America great again. Right, really interesting. Um, Nico McDonald, if, if you're there and you wouldn't mind having the camera on you, um, you are arguing, perhaps not against, perhaps with uh, Gail, uh, that the political debate is not about the virus, but about freedom, trust and, and responsibility. Can you expand on that? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm just fascinated by this sort of modern phenomenon that where I think it's just typical among particularly kind of liberal political perspectives, where something is going the way that you want, you kind of use expertise and science as a way of backing it up. And I see this, particularly in the debate about climate change, actually. Um, and, you know, the reality is that, you know, nothing is, you know, nothing is neutral as an issue, climate change isn't, and the pandemic isn't. And, uh, we take this view, I mean, just for instance, you know, it's fine for people to say we should have lockdown, but most of the people saying that are people who can work from home, who have people delivering stuff to them, whose electricity and internet continues to work because workers are out there making sure it continues to work. Uh, and it's as if there's no externalities or consequences from this. And we're paranoid the only things we count are things that get counted in a kind of Stalinist fashion. And because nobody counts the cost of the externalities, the cancer treatments that go undone, you know, not had, um, the mental health effects, um, people being made redundant, uh, we think they don't sort of balance the scale. And I, I find that sort of risk averse, you know, the only risks we'll accept or talk about are ones that we know about. But you know, every policy, whether it's on climate change or the pandemic, has an externality and a, a, a you know a counterbalancing effect and impact. And uh, it, it's just delusional not to consider that. So I think this is a very political issue. And I think we're going to discover that climate change is a very political issue, that the people who will suffer because of the policies that we want to implement or are implementing will be ordinary working class people and people in the developing world. And I know there's a counter argument, Bangladesh is sinking, et cetera. Um, 
but uh, you know, nothing, it, it's really bad faith to resent something as being everyone in the human race should be on the same side. That's just, it's, uh, I think it's very bad faith politics. It, it, okay, how does that affect uh, your view of how the US response to COVID should evolve? I mean, what, what does it mean in policy terms? Well, I think as we're going to discover with the you know tier two and tier three lockdowns, if you don't bring people along in your political decision making, if you don't respect them and trust them to have an intelligent discussion with you, which doesn't just say the science says this, do it, then it won't work. And we're going to find that the current tier two and tier three, three lockdowns are not going to be adhered to because the government has lost our trust and faith because it won't have a grown up discussion with us. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, it would be the same in the US. I mean, I don't, I don't think Trump has acted wisely about this, but I also think, you know, Biden in the debate yesterday just said, we will have a different policy from Trump and he's let 200,000 people die. Well, that's nonsense. You know, people would have died anyway. They have comorbidities. They're not dying because of COVID, they're dying earlier because of COVID. And if Biden really thinks he's got better insight or wisdom he should show it not just try and show up trump for being a some kind of mass murderer so i oh. don't think the debate is very mature i think you know i think you know fauci is probably a more credible commentator and expert and i'm debating b in the chat about this at the moment but you know i, I think there is something about the fact that in western countries we do have a sense of freedom and independence and that goes along with responsibility of course that is not being respected. Uh, and I see that in America. And, uh, you know, yes, I, I mean, we're gonna do things that have consequences. People will die. And, and we accept that in society normally, that freedoms do have consequences. You know, we don't lock down people during the flu season. We know people will die from it, but we do accept that in our society. We've just lost that ability to accept that there are consequences from of the freedoms that we have. Sorry, I, I know I'm being a bit didactic here, but no, I no, it, you feel it, the politician it, can't hearing us. I, I want to turn it into a question for both Nicolette and Gail before we run out of time. I mean, in fairness to Biden in, in yesterday's debate, he didn't simply say, I will have a better policy. He, um, he said it would consist of some specifics, including masks, rapid testing, which uh, my goodness, we could use here. Um, more resources for schools and businesses that need to make themselves more resilient. And one thing I picked out in today's SenseMaker was this almost bizarre conversation that they had about plexiglass. Um, Biden specifically made the point that restaurants need plexiglass and, and Trump picked him up on it and said, no, you can't have plexiglass in restaurants. These restaurants are dying. They don't have the money for it and plexiglass is very expensive. Well, in fact, um, it's... It, fairly standard now for any restaurant that wants to stay open in the age of in the age of covid but um uh, but thank you nico because i think you make a, 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 a lot of important points there and i'm being a bit reductive here but i wanted to boil it down into in, into a question about um uh american uh, fidelity to freedom in, in a sense 220,000 plus people have died um, why do you think that hasn't had more political cut through in the US over the past uh, six months, six to nine, nine months? Uh, why is Trump's uh, base still a solid 40% and more in, in, in some states? Um, I mean, Biden did uh, try to uh, exploit this issue in the debate last night, may, uh, speaking directly to the camera about people who would reach out in their bed and there's nobody there anymore. Um, but f f um, uh, Nico's right in a sense for a, for a very large um, uh, constituency, this is this is not a political disaster for which Trump is being held responsible. I, I mean, uh, who'd like to go first, Nicolette? Um, so. I just 
cut cut me off because I, I actually really am interested in hearing um, what, what Gail's response is as well. But Nico said a lot of things that I think need to be unpacked. And the first one that I, I want to start with is the idea that 228,000 people would have died anyway. Um, that is not quite, to me, that is a bit more reductionist than as, as a public health um, scientist I can sit with because if, if we look at it that way, we're all going to die anyway. And so what's the point of doing anything um, to stop a pandemic? It's not that there is not merit in understanding that those, there are comorbidities, but it is understanding that if we're being honest about it, the, the individuals who suffered and not all of them died because they had comorbidities, um, but the individuals who died who did have comorbidities we're managing those comorbidities. Comorbidities can, if well managed, also be chronic. And so while their lifespan was shortened, their lifespan was, I, I think the, the other way to look at it is their lifespan was arrested while they were managing these comorbidities due to a pandemic. So it's not enough to just say they were gonna die anyway, they died because of COVID. It's also important to understand that the flu and COVID are not the same for many reasons, one of which is there is the option to have a vaccine. And the option to be vaccinated against flu is something that we Oops. all understand to be a, a, a part of our personal responsibility, if we want to look at it that way. That is a portion of, of science, healthcare, whatever you want to, however you want to frame that being made available to us. And so to me, that's another part. And in addition to the fact that the viruses themselves, the progression of disease is very different, the fatality rates are different, there's also a vaccine. But we, we also have to be very honest about the fact that this pandemic is not affecting everyone equally. And so while you frame it around the people who get to work from home, I would frame it around the populations that are both socially vulnerable and medically vulnerable who are not having the same experience with the pandemic. So it is easy to say, let's talk about our personal experience with the pandemic without acknowledging the fact that how we all have navigated this pandemic as populations who might have privilege or resources or have the ability to work from home is not it. That's not, that's not it. It's not, it's not just about how I am able to navigate the pandemic. It is about those workers that you mentioned but I think part of what we have to understand is that those measures and the responsible conversation that you point out should be had with people, citizens, residents about how to how to navigate the pandemic is also about protecting those individuals. So yeah. we're not just doing it for us. It's not just about benefit for us. It's about what the actions that we're able to take do to protect those who don't have the option to stay at home, who do need to be able to go to work so that we can get our coffee, our food, our medicines on a routine basis. And if we don't do that, we are putting them at greater risk. So it's not just about what happens in our household, it's about how the actions that we're taking, because we may not be personally affected in our households, impact our community. So I would take some of what you said and actually put it on a tilt to understand that it's not just COVID impacting all of us. We have to be focused on the individuals who are being impacted more disproportionately for various reasons. And to me, the policy should tilt towards being able to protect those who are socially and medically vulnerable. Thank you, Nicolette. Let me come to you, uh, Gail, for a final word. Yeah, and I, I think Nicolette's absolutely right. Look, the smart way to do this, there is a way uh, to walk and chew gum at the same time, to deal with the health implications and, and protecting people without shutting down economies entirely. And Nicolette points to much of it. And, and part of what's necessary to do that is to follow and proceed with what we know makes a difference, masks, testing, and distancing, and to prioritize communities in the way she suggests. So I don't think, I think it's a bit of a false choice to say either we have freedom or we're all oppressed by masks, which is kind of the, the way the debate has unfolded here. And I think this, this freedom question, I, I find challenging. Um, I don't think we afford people the freedom if they know they're HIV positive to have unprotected sex as much as possible. Most countries have regulations that don't give you the freedom to drink and drive. And what we're talking about here is a virus that's transmitted 
between people has killed a lot of people. And the simple ask of people is protect yourself and protect your community. I don't think that's an infringement on freedom. I think it has been cast that way. So what do we need to do going forward? It's a question of how you weave all of these things together. <clears throat> we have the ability to exert greater control over this virus. Uh, we have the ability when a vaccine becomes available to deploy it in such a way that is equitable in terms of fairness, but also smart in terms of the science. We have a way to manage economies and to prioritize those who are the most vulnerable, our essential workers and so on, as Nicolette suggested, so that we can keep things going and deal with both the health impacts and the economic and social impacts, because I would agree that those are absolutely paramount. We can't do that if we're divided, if we let opinions trump facts in cases where facts are available. Um, and if we make this essentially a political debate rather than a robust debate and discussion among citizens about how we get to the other side. Because what we're all doing now is extending the life of a pandemic with all of its consequences. And I don't think anybody's really for that. Gail, Nicolette, Nico, uh, Effie and others, thank you very much. We're three minutes over. I've learned a lot. I can summarize four of them very briefly. This should have started in January. The federal response would have made a lot of difference. A, a complicated federal system was allowed to complicate the response instead of, instead of coordinate it. Um, there is, as Effie said, a public edu education job to be done without condescending to those who have different views. Uh, that is intended, Nico, as a nod to, to yours. Uh, and finally, I was really struck, Gail, by uh, your simple but, but very uplifting Friday lunchtime, it's lunchtime over here, um, concept of harnessing American pride and can do in a different direction. Um, I, I hope that happens as someone, uh, most of whose immediate family are US citizens. Um, Thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. And do join us again next Friday for the third and last Sensemaker Live American special hosted by my colleague Matt Dancona on American culture and values. But in the meantime, thanks again to Nicolette and Gail and Julia, although she's had to leave us, and all my colleagues. Have a great weekend. Thanks a lot. Bye.